A quarterback change in New Orleans, the situation worsens in Dallas, and the one metric that helped me understand that it was definitely time to move on from Trevor Simeon. We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? Welcome into another episode of Locked On Saints, your daily podcast covering the New Orleans Saints, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thanks so much for making Locked On Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget that we're free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube as well. I'm your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson, NOLA on Twitter, Canal Street Chronicles, Locked On NFL, and here with you every single Monday through Friday on Locked On Saints. And on today's episode of Locked on Saints, I want to start off with the big news around the New Orleans Saints. Uh, Taysom Hill is going to be the starting quarterback or the intent is for Taysom Hill to be the starting quarterback heading into Thursday night's matchup up against the Dallas Cowboys. This is according to Ian Rappaport over at NFL Network and NFL.com and every Saints fan everywhere because all pretty much everybody has kind of been calling for this over the course of of the last four games. If you haven't been around, the last four games haven't gone great for the New Orleans Saints under Trevor Simeon ever since Jameis Winston left with an ACL tear with some MCL damage. Turns out the MCL damage, not as bad. Successful ACL surgery for the young man, by the way. So glad to see that he'll be on his road to recovery uh, since that Buccaneers game. But Trevor Simeon came in in relief of Jameis Winston and kind of lit up the Buccaneers, did everything the Buccaneers didn't expect him to do. Sean Payton didn't really change the game plan, continued to attack downfield, all of that with Trevor Simeon. But for the next four games, while while uh, Taysom Hill was still recovering from the concussion that he had suffered week five ahead of the bye week up against the Washington football team, and then later on, he came back up against the Atlanta Falcons and continued to play sort of his slasher role and then played up against the Tennessee Titans in that role as well, ended up with a foot injury. According to Jeff Duncan, seems that he was dealing with plantar fasciitis. You remember that from uh, Drew Brees dealing with that not too long ago as well, just a few seasons away uh, or removed from that now. Um, and the the Saints ended up rolling with Taysom, excuse me, Trevor Simeon while Taysom Hill was still trying to get better. Then there were these kind of two awkward games against Philadelphia and against the Buffalo Bills where they felt that he was healthy enough to put in in an emergency quarterback situation, but essentially playing him throughout the length of a game didn't make sense for them. They were concerned about the foot injury at that point. Well, now it seems that he is healthy enough to be getting first team snaps in practice. No more sort of is it a walkthrough? Is it full speed? He's operating full speed as QB1 right now in practice, according to uh, some reports around Ian Rappaport and elsewhere. So with that being the case, as long as Taysom Hill remains healthy, Throughout this practice week, it looks like he'll be the starting quarterback up against the Dallas Cowboys on Thursday night football at home in front of, you know, 70,000 New Orleans Saints fans in the Caesars Superdome. Now, that becomes that comes with some questions, but it also comes with some excitement because of the fact that Taysom Hill does give you something extra in this game. He gives you a little bit of land yet, like we always promise here on the show, Trevor Simeon, not a mobile quarterback. Uh, takes very deep dropbacks, essentially welcomes pressure because of that, but then doesn't know how to respond when he feels that pressure. Not very good under pressure. We saw the two sacks that he took late up against the Tennessee Titans, where he should have thrown the ball away in both of those occasions, one of which he was running away and was being chased down from behind, absolutely had the time to throw it away. And so when you look at sort of where it is that Taysom Hill gives you a little bit more Uh, of a a greater dynamic, it's certainly in the run game. They'll be able to use him in terms of design runs. They'll also be able to use him hopefully as a little bit of a, he's not the most elusive guy, let's be real. Taysom Hill is more of a, I'm going to run over you type. But if he's able to use those legs, extend some plays, then all of a sudden he gives the New Orleans Saints a chance. Now he's going to be going up against the guy that might be one of the leaders when it comes to defensive player of the year conversation in Trayvon Diggs. He's got, you know, he's a leader in, in interceptions right now in the NFL and he's had a remarkable season so far. So don't really necessarily need to see any kind of like moonshots or anything like that heading over towards Trayvon Diggs and that area. But if he's able to run sort of that short to the intermediate area game, if he's able to extend some plays and help some wide receivers get weird and get open at some point while they're kind of running around and everything, playing that sort of schoolyard style of ball, 
then I think that that will end up working in the Saints' favor just in terms of having something different than what they've had over the course of the four consecutive losses that we've seen since that Tampa Bay Buccaneers win week eight. So for the Saints, you're looking at getting that part of the game in, this extra dynamic in the run game in particular. Hopefully the plantar fasciitis, the foot injury isn't so concerning that they aren't able to really program him into the run game. That's really what you want to see Taysom Hill do. That's what he does best. That's what makes him special. So ideally, that foot injury doesn't end up taking away what makes him special under center. And by putting the ball in his hands every single play, you don't want to lose that sort of dynamic and that extra element of his game, because then that ends up impacting the way you're able to potentially use Mark Ingram, who was full uh, on practice on Monday. Um, Alvin Kamara could potentially make his way back. He and Ryan Ramchick were both limited on Monday. So it'd be great to just have that rushing attack back that can help to extend some plays. I mean, you won't have to, if you're going to go for it on fourth and two, fourth and short, you don't have to put the ball in Blake Gilligan's hands and have him try to throw down field. Again, you can run with Taysom Hill. You can run with some of these other guys that you're com- that are coming back that you trust a little bit more with the ball in their hands. I mean, to take the ball out of Trevor Simeon's hands and put it in Blake Gilligan's gives you a pretty good idea of just how comfortable the Saints actually were with Trevor Simeon under center by the time that that four game losing streak had you know come to a, a head. And so that's what you get with getting Taysom Hill back. You get that extra element, but there are some concerns. He's not the best deep ball thrower. We saw the Saints go deep with Trevor Simeon quite a bit, and he threw some nice passes down there with the exception of the big desperation heave that ended up getting picked off toward the end of the Buffalo game. But at that point, you're just trying to make something happen. So has Taysom Hill gotten to a place where maybe he's a little bit more comfortable with taking those deep shots? He's not laying them up, putting so much air under them like we've seen in the past. And is he going to be able to get the ball out quickly, get through his progressions? And an easy way to help him out with getting through his progressions is you just give the guy half field reads. It doesn't mean that he only makes one read. You just put a route combination over on the other side so that he can make effectively a read off of a key and then choose between two or three routes on that side of the field or tuck and run. And so I think that you have to simplify the game a little bit with this being Taysom's first start since Philadelphia last year. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. I think that this offense would benefit from the game plan, maybe being a little bit simplified, considering that you have undrafted wide receivers. At best, you have a third round wide receiver that's going to be out there. You have undrafted tight ends. Depending upon what happens with your running back, you might have a first round running back out there. But if you don't, then you've got undrafted and, you know, uh, late round running backs. And then you end up having this sort of patchwork offensive line if you're missing Tron Armstead but get Ryan Ramchick back then you're starting a whole other offensive line combination than what you had the week prior and the Saints are already in a position to where they're into I think it's 11 starting offensive line combinations so far this season which is amongst the most in the NFL they started 16 last year which was the most in the NFL so this is something that the Saints are just going to have to continue to deal with now that they move to Trevor uh, excuse me now that they move to Taysom Hill every lineup that they put out there is going to be a brand new lineup Uh, for them, right? So this is going to be really interesting to see the way that the Saints navigate this, but there are ways to simplify the game plan, work to everyone's strengths, and especially if you can get the run game back, you can get Ryan Ramchick back, and at least Mark Ingram back, if not Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara, then you're able to extend drives and help out your defense so that they're not out on the field so often. So we'll see how it is that the New Orleans Saints are able to build this all around Taysom Hill, but I'm excited to see a little bit of a change for what the New Orleans Saints have put on the field over the course of the last four weeks and those four consecutive losses. uh, Taysom Hill is going to be your starting quarterback Thursday night up against the Dallas Cowboys as long as he remains healthy here throughout the practice week. It's finally here. It's Taysom time. More on Taysom Hill and Trevor Simeon here in a moment. We're going to talk about the one metric that helped me understand that it was time to move on from Trevor Simeon. But first, we have to talk about the ongoing situation in Dallas and get you updated with everything going on there and player availability still being a big question for this Thursday night matchup between the Saints and Cowboys. We've got that and much more coming up for you here in just a moment on today's episode of Locked on Saints. But first, I want to tell you about our friends over at Beachbound.com Vacations. As many of you know, Megan and I, my wife, we just recently got married. We use Beachbound.com to book our honeymoon because with Beachbound.com, you're able to be bound for whatever it is that you're looking for. You're bound for passion for togetherness, for rejuvenation, or are you just simply bound for a beach? Well, one of the best ways to go ahead and get that trip taken care of is over at beachbound.com. We got ourselves a nice little beach resort. Our backyard was the ocean. Our backyard was the uh, the beach, which is awesome. Like I'm used to being around bodies of water, but usually they're bayous. 
not the same type of water we're talking about here when it comes to the ocean. So I was very excited to be able to be, uh, you know, to enjoy that and be able to enjoy that for a nice uh, couple of days. We also had a nice pool we were able to go to, get some taco flights out there. It was a great time. We had some sports, able to watch some TV as well out there. So really, really cool stuff. So go and check them out over at beachbound.com. You can find the perfect beach vacation for you, no matter what it is that you're looking for. So what are you bound for? Find out today at beachbound.com. All right, Huda Nation, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. The Dallas Cowboys uh, dealing with something that New Orleans Saints fans should be very, very familiar with. Uh, as a reminder, early on this season, week two up against the Carolina Panthers, New Orleans Saints had a COVID outbreak within their facility that led to several coaches being placed on the reserve list all throughout the practice week, as well as many being unavailable for game day. So they lost, uh, I think it was six different coaches on their game day staff on the sideline. You had uh, Ian Book, who was an inactive quarterback for that game, handling substitutions. Ryan Nielsen was jumping in virtually trying to help out this team. A lot of the different calls that were being made to the defensive line were kind of wonky. I mean, it was a tough game for the New Orleans Saints, and it was a tough one, and it was a tough loss for them. So we're kind of watching this happen now with the Dallas Cowboys. Dallas Cowboys right now up to nine different players or coaches that are currently showing up with positive tests and that are on the reserve list. That includes two players and seven coaches. You got strength and conditioning coaches, offensive line coach, offensive line assistants, offensive assistants, and of course, the head coach in Mike McCarthy, including two players as well, starting right tackle Terrence Steele and rookie cornerback Nashawn Wright, who was just added to the list this morning. And they've had several players end up with a uh, positive test over the last 12 days, which includes wide receiver Amari Cooper, who's back in the news today because he's already missed two games, but he's yet to be activated from the COVID reserve list because he's still showing symptoms at the moment. As an unvaccinated player, he only needed to be on the list for 10 days. That was the usual protocol. But then beyond those 10 days, as long as he's still showing symptoms, he's not able to be activated from that list. So according to head coach Mike McCarthy, who spoke to media virtually, he mentioned that if Amari Cooper isn't able to practice tomorrow on Wednesday, that it feels very unlikely that he'll play on Thursday. So a big time developing story to watch for the Dallas Cowboys and for the New Orleans Saints, because if the Dallas Cowboys are going to end up having to come into this game without Amari Cooper, without their starting right tackle, without offensive line coaches and offensive line assistants, and without their head coach in Mike McCarthy, it's going to be challenging for them, regardless of who they're able to put out on the field. Now, it's not all of a sudden going to turn into an easy win for the New Orleans Saints, right? Like the Saints are still going to have to get this, are still going to have to work to get this win if they want to stop the bleeding and stop this four game win streak without allowing it to extend to five before they have to travel on the road next week up against the New York Jets, who are a beatable team, but in not great conditions, probably December in New Jersey. So for the Saints, they have to focus on trying to win this game on Thursday in sort of the same way that Julian Council, host of Locked on Panthers, broke it down and, and, and looked at the sort of situation in week two for the Panthers, who if they were going to have any week in which they could upset the Saints, that was the week. If there's going to be any week in which the Saints can upset the Dallas Cowboys, these are the conditions for it to happen. And they're unfortunate conditions. So we always have to break up the on-field part of this conversation, as well as the health and safety human being part of the conversation. And we know that second, there is nothing paramount to or out, out of those second, out of those two things. When it comes to the latter, there is nothing more paramount than the health and safety of the players and the coaches that are dealing with this. And on the field, there's still a game that has to be played. So when it comes to that game, removing the human aspect of it while still acknowledging it, this gives the New Orleans Saints hope. This gives New Orleans Saints fans a little bit of hope going into this one. Now, it's not going to be easy. Dak Prescott is still an extremely good quarterback. They still have very, very good wide receivers. CeeDee Lamb looks like he's on his way back from his concussion. They still have Michael Gallup over on the other side, as well as some other wide receivers and Dalton Schultz at tight end who can still get the job done as well and help in the passing game. They have a very good run game still with the with the tandem of Ezekiel Elliott, who is still expected to be a part of this game, as well as Tony Pollard, even if he wasn't. I mean, this is not going to be an easy game for the New Orleans Saints by any means, but the Saints are getting healthier while mounting question marks of availability or unavailability are sort of piling up for the Dallas Cowboys. For the New Orleans Saints, we did see Mark Ingram back full at practice on Monday. Great news there. We also saw Alvin Kamara and Ryan Ramchek back limited 
on Monday. So something to watch in terms of their progress going into Tuesday and Wednesday's practices. And then on the defensive side, still not seeing much progress on the defensive line. Malcolm Roach, as well as uh, Peyton Turner, both still on injured reserve. But also Marcus Davenport and Tano Passanio ha- did not practice on Monday. So that defensive line might still be a little thin going into this one. Expect to see a lot of Carl Granderson, who actually had a nice game up against the Bills, as well as uh, Cam Jordan, and then maybe a little bit of Jalen Holmes getting mixed in there as well. The Saints did some interesting things. They blitzed a little bit more and used uh, Caden Ellis as an edge rusher. He's also out right now of practice. He's missed the last couple. So the Saints are going to have to find ways to continue to be creative uh, in the midst of uh, their lack of availability on the defensive line at this point, which is unusual for the Saints who like to rotate eight or nine players every game when they can, but they don't right now have the reserves available available or the pieces available to be able to do that. So we'll see how they continue to navigate that. Uh, Teron Armstead still hasn't participated in practice, so you might get Ryan Ramchick back, but you might still have James Hurst over at the left tackle spot. James Hurst has performed, I'll say, valiantly at that spot. He's had some ups and downs so far, but hey, it could be a lot worse uh, for the New Orleans Saints, at least if they're able to get Ryan Ramchick back, then they're in a really good spot to be able to continue to run where they like to run, which is between those tackles. They love getting in between the tackles there. So we'll see how the New Orleans Saints continue to navigate their situation about the offensive and defensive side. We'll watch how the Dallas Cowboys are navigating their uh, sort of team wide at this point. Um, uh, situation and, and, and everything that's going on with them ahead of this Thursday night matchup. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more here about that Thursday night matchup, but in a little bit of a different angle, because we're going to go into our analytics Tuesday, and we're really going to focus on one analytic here. What is the one piece of information that helped me understand that it was time to move on from Trevor Simeon and why it should be taste some time going into this Dallas Cowboys matchup? We've got that and much more coming up for you as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. But before we get to that, I want to make sure that I remind you about our friends over at betonline.ag. The line for the New Orleans Saints-Dallas Cowboys game is moving, and it's moving in favor of New Orleans, sort of what we anticipated with everything going on around the Dallas Cowboys. The line started off at minus six the last time that we spoke. Now, minus four and a half. So you're feeling a little bit better about the Saints' ability to be able to cover that spread, or maybe you're feeling not so good about them being able to cover that spread. You wanted the bigger, the bigger spread there. You can go ahead and get in over at betonline.ag. Don't like betting on your favorite team. You also got the NBA, NHL, mixed martial arts, including some of your favorite Vegas casino games as well. A ton of stuff over at betonline.ag. If you can think it, you can bet on it over on the website. And if you're a first time customer, you've never been there before, make sure you use the promo code locked on, L O C K E D O N, so you can get a 50% welcome bonus. A ton of fun over at betonline.ag, where the game starts. Let's get it, Houdat Nation, wrapping up today's episode of Locked On Saints. Thanks as always for making us your first listen of the day. Have to say, real quick, if you got a moment, Go and check out our friends over at Locked on LSU. Matt Moscona talked about the Brian Kelly LSU Tiger hire. And you can also check out our friends over at Locked on Pelicans. Jake Madison, the Pelicans knocking off the Clippers Monday night. Big news all around Louisiana sports. So make sure you're checking out Locked on LSU and Locked on Pelicans as well. But we appreciate you as always making Locked on Saints your first listen. So I wanted to do something a little bit different here when it came to Analytics Tuesday. And instead of throwing a bunch of numbers at you and talking about a whole bunch of things, I wanted to focus on one specific metric that kind of puts a pin for me in the conversation about whether or not it was time to move on from Trevor Simeon. So there are a couple of things that we need to acknowledge about the Trevor Simeon experience over the course of these last four games. First of all, his wide receivers, tight ends, pass catchers, not really helping him out at all. Offensive line injured, defense struggled because the offense wasn't able to stay on the field. And then you saw, you know, Marshawn Lattimore has really struggled over the course of these last four or five games as well. And of course, Over the last two games in particular, you saw no run game, right? Uh, No Mark Ingram, no Alvin Kamara having to move forward with guys like Tony Jones Jr. and Ty Montgomery didn't really work out for the Saints uh, trying to make it work with those guys, as well as the injuries that were there on the offensive line, which didn't really support the run game and also kept a lot of pressure on Trevor Simeon. But individually, I wanted to take a look at Trevor Simeon's performance. How much of what went wrong for him over the course of the last two games in particular came down to not having good pass catching options versus bad play, right? And so for me, that's what I wanted to see. How much of it was individually comes, how much of it individually came down to Trevor Simeon versus how much was he impacted by the players around him? There's absolutely no doubt at all that 
he was impacted by the players around him. But did he do enough individually to really make you feel comfortable moving forward? I've sort of always said over the course of the last couple of weeks that I don't think he does enough for you because he's not mobile. And this is a, a, a an offense that needs an extra threat, that needs an extra dimension right now. Even with getting Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram back potentially over the course of either this week or maybe the next couple of weeks, getting them both back, even with that, you still need a little extra something. You still need a little bit of land yap. And as we talked about in that first segment, Taysom Hill kind of gives that to you because you have the the threat of the designed run, hopefully a little bit of uh, you know escapability, which he hasn't been super good at Taysom Hill over the course of his time, but we've also only really seen four games with him. So let's see if he'll be able to develop some of what we saw Taylor Heineke do up against the, uh, or, or just last night, uh, Monday night football up against the Seattle Seahawks. So, you know, even if that kind of stuff doesn't happen, you still get a little something extra with Taysom Hill, which I think this New Orleans Saints offense desperately needs. And there's just no sense in settling into what has led you to four straight losses over the course of the last four weeks. No sense in doing that. So you got to try something a little bit new. But there's one particular metric that I've found here and that I've looked at and that you can kind of feel when you watch the games that really, particularly over these last two games, makes me feel like, okay, yeah, they're right. It's time to move on from Trevor Simeon. And it's catchable pass rate. If you look at Sports Info Solutions, some of these other metric sites, even Player Profiler, who also works with Underdog Fantasy and a bunch of other pieces, um, you can find this metric. And it's really interesting because basically it just lets you know how many of the passes a quarterback is throwing that's, that are actually catchable, right? How many of them are within frame, even just slightly out of frame, but still catchable, but not perfect, uh, you know, between the numbers in the chest, not too high, not too low, all of those things. Um, Trevor Simeon has not done very well in this metric. And it, it's really telling over the last two games, because over the first two games up against the Atlanta Falcons and the Tennessee Titans, Sports Info Solutions had him at like 88 plus percent when it came to catchable pass rating. He was fourth in the NFL in that metric. After these last two games, that percentage has dropped to 63.2 percent, 37th out of qualifying quarterbacks in the NFL, a true completion percentage of 60.7%. So not very good. And remember when we talked about how the New Orleans Saints were really, really good in the red zone at the beginning of the season, but then once the quarterback change happened, we saw the red zone percentage or the red zone scoring percentages kind of drop off, actually both on the offensive and defensive side, but focusing on the offensive side, 48.1% completion percentage for Trevor Simeon in the red zone in 2021. Again, not good, but really the big thing for me is this 63.2% catchable pass rate. In the four games that Taysom Hill played, and this might surprise some of you, but in the four games that Taysom Hill played last year, over an 80% catchable pass rate. There were some passes that were not catchable, right? Remember the interception up against the Philadelphia Eagles? We actually saw most of those non-catchable passes or uncatchable passes coming in that Philadelphia Eagles game. We can kind of erase the Denver Broncos game because he barely threw any passes there. But up against the Atlanta Falcons, he played extremely well and threw a lot of catchable passes, but he was over 80% in that metric. Over these four games, we're watching uh, Trevor Simeon struggle to stay over 60%. So for me, that shows you on an individual performance basis, unaffected or unimpeded by the performance or drops or anything of his wide receivers or pass catchers, 63.2% catchable pass rate. That's not accurate. (laughs) Those are not accurate passes that are being thrown by Trevor Simeon. And he's not necessarily always giving other receivers or the pass catchers that he does have. He's not really giving them an opportunity to catch the ball. We certainly saw that last week up against the Buffalo Bills with passes going over even Lil Jordan Humphrey's head, who by no means is Lil. He's big, six foot four. You don't go a foot over his head on a crossing pattern, right? And look, you can look at the pressure from the offensive line. You can look at all of that. That's absolutely fine and absolutely fair to say, hey, maybe that impacted these numbers as well. And maybe some of that is fair. He was under pressure for 13 snaps up against the Buffalo Bills, under pressure for 12 snaps up against the Philadelphia Eagles, actually performed a little bit better under pressure up against the Eagles than he did against the Bills, but even in situations when he was clean against the Philadelphia, excuse me, up against the, uh, yeah, the Philadelphia Eagles, 62.1% completion percentage when kept clean. And that included, let me see how many drops that included two drops. So an adjusted completion percentage of just 69%, but also through two interceptions against the Eagles when he was kept clean. And then when he was going up against the Buffalo Bills, you're talking about a completion percentage of only 63.2% 
in that case when he was kept clean, no pressure in his face, including an interception and only one drop pass. So it turned the ball over more when he was clean than when he was under pressure. So it's hard for me to say that he was really impacted by the pressure to an extent that we should rule out the catchable uh, percentages because we have to look at how just poorly he threw the ball when he was kept clean as well. And look, I I hate to just pile on the guy or anything like that. But look, when you look at the inability to be able to deliver catchable passes, particularly over the last two weeks, the struggle that this offense has already had over and over again with staying on the field and a better run game would certainly help you with that. And the lack of extra oomph, that lack of extra dynamic that might be able to help keep you alive in some of those situations. There's just no reason here to continue moving forward and settling with Trevor Simeon. And instead, just try something new. And it looks like that's what the New Orleans Saints are ready to do on Thursday, as long as Taysom Hill can stay healthy. So that's why I am a okay with the New Orleans Saints making the change at quarterback and uh, trying out Taysom Hill here over Trevor Simeon. Once again, y'all, we very much appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day here on Locked on Saints. Got a fun episode coming up for you tomorrow, Film Watch Wednesday. We'll break it down a little bit further. What else should we expect to be different when it comes to Taysom Hill being under center potentially on Thursday night up against the Dallas Cowboys? And we'll try to find whatever performances we can salvage. That first half defense looked really good. We'll break down some of that film and then why everything changed in the second half. We've got that as well as our WWL Wednesday coming up tomorrow as well. For your second listen today, though, make sure you go and check out our good friends over at Locked on Bets, your boy Q, handicapping expert Lee Sterling. Go and win yourself some money this week with the good guys over at Locked on Bets. So I appreciate you, everybody. And remember, for everything in between the daily episodes of Locked on Saints to help keep up with your New Orleans Saints, Follow me on Twitter at Raw Shacks and N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how your mom and them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.